talks on psychoanalysis shares topics published in the IPA Society Journals and Congress Debates Worldwide, brought you in the voices of the original authors. We hope this window will allow you to experience the depth and breadth of psychoanalytic thought around the world. This podcast has been created by Gaetano Pellegrini and edited by Gaetano Pellegrini and Andy Cohen. Introduction read by Andy Cohen. In this episode, we will dive with Gohar Homayanpur into the tale of 1001 Nights to bring a new articulation to the female Oedipus complex in contemporary Persia, allowing for the emergence of new possibilities of loving. Through a psychoanalytic textual analysis of the nights, the author uncovers various archetypes of women that have been extinct from a more mainstream discourse, not only in Iran. The archetypes of Persian women populating Shahrazad's tales night after night have been lost to sources of female identifications. The paper sets out to tell a story and within it wishes to refind a whole and integrated Shahrazad as an object of female identifications. Dr. Gohar Homanyanpur is an author and psychoanalyst and member of the International Psychoanalytical Association, American Psychoanalytic Association, the Italian Psychoanalytical Society, and the National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis. She is the training and supervising psychoanalyst of the Freudian Group of Tehran, where she is also founder and former director. She has published various psychoanalytic articles, and her book, Doing Psychoanalysis in Tehran, published by MIT Press in August 2012, won the Gradiva Award and has been translated into French, German, Italian, and Turkish. Tell me a story, Sherazad, in analysis in contemporary Persia. Our story begins in a land not that far away, in the city of Sherazad. Once a harmonious and fertile land, it has been ruined by the maddening terror and fatal rage of King Shahriar, who has been betrayed by his wife. The inhabitants are fleeing the city, attempting to save their daughter's lives. Once upon a time, there lived a king with two lion-hearted sons, Shahriar and Shah Zaman. After the death of the king, the two brothers divide the kingdom and ruled in harmony and peace for 20 years. Then one day, a twist of fate leads both brothers to find out about the escapades of their queens. A revengeful Shahriar slays his queen and her lover and convinced that all women are unfaithful makes a decision to deflower a virgin every night and kill her the next morning to make sure that no woman will ever be unfaithful to him again. After three years of this practice, Shahriar asks his vizier, who's the highest official of the king, to provide an eligible maid. The vizier has two daughters, Sherazad and Donyazad. When Sherazad hears about this situation from her father, she volunteers for this marriage. Her father tries to dissuade her with a story, a story that doesn't work, as Sherazad thanks her father, but pursues her own plan. The story that doesn't work marks the very beginning of the culture of narrative and storytelling within 1001 Nights. Therefore, the first story told is the one told by the father, a father who, in spite of his powerful political position at the king's court, allows his daughter to decide her own destiny, as he has faith in her subjectivity and desire. On the other hand, it is Sherazad's belief and knowledge that not all men are the same, her father being the example par excellence of this fact which comes from her trust in her own integrated sense of self and leads her eventually to success. It's also noteworthy that another reason for Sherazad's success is the collaboration of her sister. In fact, the two sisters collude to save the feminine soul. Hence, Sherazad tells her sister, Donyazad, when I'm taken to Shahriar's court, I will ask him to call you in for a last farewell. When our marriage is consummated, come forward and ask me to tell you a story. 
Sherazade was a possible precursor of Freud, to borrow Julia Kristeva's phrase, who discerned the secrets of the mind so well that she altered the fate of a nation and set the feminine soul free. She saves her own life and brings back a sense of creativity, play, magic, and prosperity to her beloved city. How does she do that? By telling stories and believing in the magic of the words. After a thousand and one nights of storytelling, Sherazad, who is now mother to three sons, asks Shahriar to have mercy on her and to let her live. At this point, we should note that Sherazad did not give birth to a daughter and that there's no sign of her mother anywhere. We can already begin to see the problematics, which I will develop more a little later, of the transgenerational mutation of women. To go back to the story, Shahriar embraces Sherazad and their sons, begs for her forgiveness and thanks her for having prevented him from further killings. After years of horror and hate, people are finally living a joyful life. Many scholarly efforts have tried to find the origins and whereabouts of the book and everyone agrees on the pre-Islamic roots of the book. It was the version from Egypt known as the Bulak script that was translated into Persian for a Qajar prince and became the very first Persian text of 1001 Nights. At first sight, in comparison to literally masterpieces, the night seems like an orphan in the territory of giants. But it's exactly because of this orphan status that the night is able to be the right host for all that has been suppressed by the cultural status quo. It's interesting to consider that the book has been moralized from one translation to another, and the contents of the book, just like our dreams, have been the victims of censorship time and again. The minister of culture under the Pahlavi dynasty, Ali Asghar Hikmat, one of the brightest and most modern ministers of culture in Iran, advised against reading the knights and instead recommended reading the adventures of Simbad, who, according to him, could be a great role model of a hard-working lad for the youth of the country. That's why the book ended up acting as a magnetic field, one which attracts the very characters and role models that would otherwise be banned or suppressed according to the contemporary zeitgeist. It's strange that 200 years after the first Persian translation, this situation of suppression is still ongoing. A situation that's not specific to Persia, but was also experienced by the famous French author Marcel Proust in the last century. Proust mentions his family's advice to read the censored version of the Nights, and confesses that ignoring this advice, he secretly read the uncensored version. It's for all these reasons that the Knights became a collection of the many forbidden images that were not allowed to enter and disrupt the big pervasive image presented by more official literary works. Perhaps that's the reason why there are so many different versions of the Knights. However, all the versions represent two common points. They're all part of what Mikhail Bakhtin calls the literature of the Carnivalesque, and all versions host characters who are not accepted by the moralistic values of the time. And doesn't this coincide with the exact definition of Freud for the mechanism of repression? And so isn't this book the work of the mind against repression? 1001 Nights, a text that's not actually the work of a literary scholar, but written by many authors. A text that draws on its many frames to create the condition for dialogue, often, often between people who are usually absent from the social order, those who are regarded as marginalized or improper. We must be careful of any account of carnival which simplistically considers the phenomenon as an expression of popular resentments. 
Bakhtin sees the possibility of a complete withdrawal from the present order in the carnival. He refers to this celebration of the incomplete as gay relativity, an attitude in which all the official certainties are relativized, inverted, or parodied. As Samini says, one could even go as far as to call the whole of 1001 Nights a scene for this happy carnival of subversion. Carnival is the becoming of time outside of time. Note that in the nights, Shahriar's brother is called Shah Zaman, the king of time. And the story actually begins from the time that he, the king of time, leaves the scene. It's no surprise that repression targets female characters the most. Freud has also described this repression of femininity as a remarkable feature in the psychic life of human beings equally applicable to both sexes. This repressive force finally finds its way even through our carnivalesque nights and leaves Sherazad as the last member of a female generation with three sons but not a daughter. Where has Sherazad gone? Why has she disappeared from the theaters of a large number of young contemporary Iranian women's minds? Where have all these various archetypes of women who populate the tales of 1001 Nights, night after night, disappeared to? If we consider the nights to be the psychic representation of Sherazad's internal world, we're immediately impressed with the level of psychic integration that she demonstrates. She does not try to convince the king that all women are good and only good in order to save her own life and those of generations of women to come. She attempts to demonstrate that women are not all the same and that women, like men, can have many different parts. This is closer to a third wave feminism in which women are not categorized and identified as all being the same and having the same desires. Hence the idea of one woman at a time, which is reminiscent, of course, of the psychoanalytic assertion of one case at a time. Sherazad narrates to the king and to us the stories of good women and bad ones. She tells of extremely castrating women who wish to humiliate men, but she also has space for and tales of the opposite in her mind. She tells us of women loving men, women loving women, women who have sex with both men and women, women with lovers who do not want to marry, women rulers, women commandos, women in charge, self-employed business women, women who are erotic and intelligent at the same time, women who do not wish to have children, maternal women, strong, free-spirited women, But Sherazad also tells us of those who are victims of men, women who are considered only as erotic objects. And she tells us of women who use their erotic power as sorcery to bewitch, to manipulate, castrate and humiliate. Sherazad tells us of cunning, envious and revengeful women. Throughout the nights and in the name of carnivalesque literature, we hear about all kinds of women and men. Sherazad's tales are being told during the unofficial time of night, outside of time, another major resemblance to the unconscious, within an encyclopedic carnivalesque genre, a genre with the possibility of contradictions in the margins. Could it be that Sherazad manages such liberating tale within the playground of the unconscious? because she is in touch with different parts of herself? Can we go as far as to suggest that 1001 Nights is the tale of Sherazad herself and the many parts of her that she is not afraid to know and to integrate into this final carnival of her own? But where then has Sherazad gone? Why did the daughters of Persia lose her as an original character within contemporary Iranian discourse? Was she repressed and resurrected in a disfigured manner? 
What remains of Shirazad is a complete exoticization of her as the ultimate erotic oriental figure. Shirazad gave birth to three sons but not a daughter. It seems that a metaphoric transgenerational mutation has occurred. Even our carnivalesque text of a thousand nights has not been able to bear the birth of Sherazad's daughters. But this symbolic mutation or disfiguration has had a titanic price for contemporary Iran in general and its daughters specifically. Through a psychoanalytical textual interpretation of the nights, I have attempted to uncover the long-lost image of Sherazad, an eminent female figure whose voice once echoed as a powerful archetype of the Persian woman, a voice which seems to have become fainter throughout the ages. I have tried to reveal various archetypes of women from the nights that have become completely extinct from a mainstream Iranian discourse. This elimination appears even more powerfully within the cliché Orientalist discourse, in which Iranian women are portrayed both nationally and internationally as nothing but the historical victims of a patriarchal and political trajectory. It's tragic to realize that the archetypes of Persian women who populate the tales of Sherazad night after night have been lost as sources of female identification. It seems that this transgenerational mutation of Sherazad's daughters has left the contemporary Iranian discourse regarding women with two choices, either a politicized and victimized trajectory or the new Sherazad now becomes solely an erotic and oriental figure. When we portray victimized women in Iran, we're choosing a reductionist view which ignores a large number of working women women who've been the face of political resistance in the last few decades, women who have taken care of their families upon emigration, women who've refused to submit to the oppressing laws against them, young women who are mostly university educated. Within this reductionist view, we're also failing to take into consideration that within the dynamics of some Iranian families, we come upon castrating women and hence castrated men. It's my assertion that this has led to a particular elaboration of the Oedipus complex for women in Iran. As clinical experience has shown me through my practice in Iran over the last 12 years, it seems that for many Iranian girls, the object of desire remains the mother as opposed to the classic Oedipus complex, which brings up homosexual anxieties that are expressed in a defensive reaction formation. This can lead to a great deal of destructivity in the psychic representation of envy within what might be called a culture of the Freudian death drive. This, I believe, can have the most dangerous effects upon women and their ability to become creative, playful, autonomous subjects. As Kristeva reminds us, this too seems to be a universal phenomenon. But my clinical observation shows me that it's particularly prominent within the problematics of women's relationships in Iran. Hence, to ignore it is to close off any possibility of loving between women. I've observed within clinical practice that two intense of a fusional and dyadic relationship seems to be passed on from one generation of women to the next in Iran. We can use the Sherazad metaphor to say that we were not able to carry out her legacy. She did not give birth to daughters, and so she was not able to pass on her subjective, separated, integrated, and passionate self. For years, we have observed this mutation, this repression of giving metaphoric birth to a daughter while having the capacity to let her go and to teach her the possibilities of loving within a more classical triangulation of our Freudian family romance. Perhaps the reason that we do not hear about Sherazad's mother and daughters is that they're within her, one and the same as each other, 
They're under each other's skin in both senses of the expression in English. They have fallen into her ego, are incorporated within her, encapsulated in the formula of one body, two minds. Here I'm referring to the English expression, you get under my skin, or I've got you under my skin. This, interestingly, is both an expression of sexual attraction and of becoming annoyed and angry at someone. Maybe when we're imprisoned in each other's skin, skins, there is no escaping the dead drive. I may attempt to kill you in order to free myself from you, but what a futile attempt that is. For if the shadow of the object has fallen upon the ego, as Freud magnificently elaborated in Mourning and Melancholia in 1917, our unconscious homicidal wishes become nothing more than the suicide of the subject. Generations of women experienced a fusional relationship with their mothers, as did their mothers with their own mothers. I wonder if the daughters of Persia are destined to repeat this destiny, or will we try to elaborate this and thus allow a third to come in between trans generations of women? What needs to be stressed here is not the women's genealogy that's already too durable and adhesive. We need to let men in. Clearly, I'm not talking about an actual man or father, but a function, a sort of triangulation, a thirdness, a paternal function that's bound to be introduced only via the desire of the mother. We need to elaborate on the homosexual incestuous unconscious wishes and anxieties that inevitably accompany this kind of fusion between mothers and their daughters. Clearly, these issues are nuanced, multi-layered, and on a spectrum. Clinically, I've been astonished at the lack of desire for fathers on the part of a large number of my female analytic patients. The object of desire very often remains the phallic mother. As such, these incestuous feelings on the one hand and the wish for and fear of separation on the other hand are bound to be aroused and they're uncomfortable and scary. Defenses are raised against them. And as a reaction formation, we see a territory of death, war, and destructiveness emerging between women, a territory of revenge, hate, aggression, and envy. On the surface and at first glance, this seems to be indeed a discourse of our classic Oedipus. And those dynamics are certainly present. Yet upon looking closer, I begin to notice something about these interpretations with regard to aggression. For example, so it seems that you have the idea that your mother is mean to you because she wants your father all to herself did not work as well as perhaps your mother wants you all to herself. These libidinal interpretations suddenly opened up the separation individuation discourse, which I found was crucial for those analysands on the road towards subjectivity. Certainly, there's a whole set of problems for men and boys that one could elaborate from this discourse, but that's a different essay. Could the Sherazad complex be a rebellion against the law of the father in a society that has patriarchal laws? Perhaps, but the Sherazad complex is the result of the failure of that rebellion as it has landed on the death drive. Within this complex, the mothers do not seem to have much desire beyond their children. No real thirdness can see the light of day. Certainly, I'm not discussing a full foreclosure of thirdness as in psychosis, but within a continuum and relative discourse, in an in-between stage that Gregorio Kohan has brilliantly referred to as the hysterical stage. He says, It's impossible not to take a position in relation to the desire of the mother, not to decide who, what sexual being we are for her. First, we desperately need to believe that we are the object of her desire, and then we have to go through the disillusion and the painful realization that we are not it. This moving away from the primary object is overdetermined, not free. He continues to say, 
I would suggest that in the development of the Oedipal drama of the woman, there is a hysterical stage in which the subject caught up in her need to change the object from mother to father can get fixed, unable to make the necessary choice. I repeat, as I have always said, I do believe in the universality of the Oedipus complex. This is just a slight twist, just a single story describing what I believe is a variation on the Freudian family romance. Not in a culturally relativist way, but merely in the sense of different versions of the same story, with all its twists and turns, as we work together with our patients to thicken the plot. In the final analysis, carnivalesque literature is the closest one gets to the unconscious, and hence 1001 Nights, representing a superb example of this genre, becomes an ideal text to search and research for what has been lost in the more mainstream Iranian literature and consciousness. We need to go back to Sherazad and find space within herself to tolerate the birth of her daughters. To resurrect different parts of ourselves that we were unable to face, that we were too afraid to find a tale for, even in the nights and even inside the carnival of Sherazad's tales. Let us refine Sherazad, the integrated self of Sherazad, in order to resurrect her daughters. This piece is a story. In this story, we're in search of Sherazad, the one who could become the object of identification for Iranian women, hoping that refinding her might lead to a new elaboration of the Iranian women's Oedipus complex. Let us finish at the moment when Sherazad speaks for the first and last time under 978 night. It's the only time she speaks, not with a story, but outside of a tale. My Lord, and whoever thinks that all women are the same, falls away from wisdom and his insanity is incurable.